start dynamic equilibrium, we're going to build up from rates and kinetics and eventually work into concentrations and how rates and concentrations interplay in a dynamic opposing process. So what we're going to start with is a very simple example. We're going to start with model kits. And in our first example, we're going to take two model kits and we're going to put them together to form an H2. So we're going to use two spheres to form an H2. And at the same time, we're also going to take them apart like this. So it turns out that it's much easier to put them, take them apart than put them together. So if we had two people, one person putting them together, one person taking them apart, what we would find is, is that the opposing rates are not equivalent. So let's start off with this. Let's assume that we start initially Let's assume we start with 40 spheres and zero put together. As we start, because there's no H2s to start, there's not going to be any reverse reaction rate to start. When we start, the only thing that will be going on will be the forward reaction rate, or the rate in the forward direction. So because we start with 40 of the reactants only and no product, if we were to make a plot of rate versus time, what we would expect to happen is that our forward rate would start off, and it would start off very slowly, because it's very challenging to put these together. Our reverse rate, on the other hand, would start off as zero because there's, no, there's nothing for the person to do. As this person starts to create more and more H2s, this will gradually rise until the person breaking them apart breaks them as fast as the person makes them. Now, while that's going on, if we were to look at concentration versus time, okay, and we were to start with the H's as the blue, we're going to start with a whole bunch of H's. We're going to start with 40 of them. And then over time, we're gradually going to turn a couple into H2s. But at the same time, the person making the, or breaking apart the H2s is going to do so much faster. And so we're going to find that we have very little H2s and a lot of H's over time. And additionally, we're going to see that we decrease by twice the amount as we increase here. Now, let's do another hypothetical. In this case, let's pretend that we only start with H2s. So instead of starting with 40 taken apart and zero put together, let's do a brand new experiment. And this time we're gonna have zero taken apart and 20 all put together. What will be the difference? Well now, whoever's taking them apart has a lot to take apart and can do so very quickly. So if we make two new plots, starting with rate, let's have a little more in there. Starting with rate versus time, the reverse direction now is going to start off very quickly, well up here. The forward rate can't do anything at the beginning, it's going to start out at zero. Now, because this is a such a fast rate, very quickly we're going to build up to a point where the person who's making these, where they're putting them together, is going to reach the same kind of rate that they can hit at the beginning. The reverse rate is going to start off very fast, but then it's quickly going to decline until they become equal because they're going to run out of H2s. Now, if we were to then plot what's going on with the amounts of things, we're starting with no H's, and we're going to end up with a lot of H's again. We're starting with some H2s, 20, and we're ending with almost none again. So what happens is, is concentration will affect how the rate can occur, and in a very similar fashion to what we've seen in the past in kinetics. Rate is equal to K times the concentration of either the products or is equal to K times the concentration of the reactants. And so when those two rates become equal, that is the point at which we've reached equilibrium. 
Now, the rates become equal in both instances, but the concentrations do not become equal. However, the concentrations do become constant when we've reached equilibrium. Let's look through one more example. Let's take rubber bands. So for rubber bands, if we were to take two rubber bands, we could take them and we could tie them together like this. Someone else could take them and untie them like this. It's much easier to tie them together than it is to take them apart. So in this case, we're looking at something where the forward rate is easy the reverse rate is very challenging. The opposite of our last example. So if we take an initial set of conditions where we start with 40 rubber bands and none tied together, what will happen? Well, let's take a look. For rate. So our rate in the forward direction is going to start off. It's very easy to tie them together, so we're going to start off very fast. Our rate in the reverse direction is going to start off at zero because there's nothing to do. But even as we go and start to accumulate our twos, it's going to be challenging for us to take them apart and we're going to level up. This is going to slow down as we run out of rubber bands to tie and eventually they'll become equal to each other. For our concentration, we're starting with 40 rubber bands. So way up here and we're very quickly tying them together and the concentration is going to drop. We start with zero R2s, but then very quickly that concentration is going to climb. Now, let's assume we do a second experiment and this time we switch and we start with 20 tied together and zero that are apart. So we start with these, and whoever's untying them has the unfortunate task of trying to untie them. Well, if we go ahead and construct one more set of graphs here, for our rate, if we're looking at the forward direction, the forward direction starts with a rate of zero. The reverse direction, we have a whole bunch of R2s to untie, but it's very difficult to do. As we start to untie them, we're going to have more and more R's that we can retie together, and we end up with a curve that looks like this. For our concentration versus time, now we're looking at situations where we start only with R2's. We start here. And what's going to happen is we're mostly going to stay about the same because it's very hard to untie the R2's so we don't change by much. Ours, on the other hand, we start with none, and we're going to end with mostly none, like that. So again, we see that the rates become equal when equilibrium has been achieved, and the concentrations become constant when the equilibrium has been achieved. So let's put that with a little bit of mathematics now. Dynamic equilibrium is defined as when the rates of opposing processes concentrations become constant. Now it's not static, the reaction is not stopped. We still have the opposing processes going on, but the concentrations are remaining the same. And so it's worth a final note there that the reactions in both the forward and the direction are continuing up. So what do the mathematics of that look like? Well, We know in kinetics that we can write out a rate expression. Let's do so for this reaction here. But the rate in the forward direction is equal to a constant, called K1, times the concentration of H squared. Now in kinetics, you were taught that this can't be determined from the stoichiometry. And that is true at the beginning of the reaction. So 
So if we went back to where we had our curves, when we were going down, that was, that was the case. We would have to look at rate determining steps and elementary steps in order to figure that out, and we would do that using experimental data. But once we're at equilibrium, we can no longer, we can skip that and just use the stoichiometry of the reaction. Our reverse rate is equal to a different constant times concentration of product. So since those two rates become equal at equilibrium, we can set these two equal to each other. So K1 times the concentration of H squared is equal to K2 times the concentration of H2. K2 being a rate constant, K1 being a rate constant. We're going to rearrange the equation. We have K1 over K2 is equal to our product concentration divided by our reactant concentration. Since we have a constant divided by a constant, we can change that to a single constant, which we call the equilibrium constant. When you have a forward direction reaction that's very simple and a reverse that's very challenging, what will happen is the forward direction will dominate and you'll have to build up a lot of product in order to get to equilibrium. In that case, when you have a lot of product, this equilibrium constant will be large. When your equilibrium constant is large, that means you would have a lot of product at equilibrium. That's going to be the case in something like our rubber bands. For rubber bands, it's very easy for the forward reaction, very difficult for the reverse. So I need to have a large concentration of this so that reverse rate can speed up, a very small concentration of this so that forward rate can slow down, and I can, be, I can obtain equal opposing rates. If my K is very small, that's the opposite. That's more like our model kits. In our model kits, the forward rate is very challenging, very slow. The reverse rate is very fast. And so I need to build up a lot of reactant in order to speed up the forward rate and very little product so that the forward reverse rate slows down. So if K is small, I'm going to have a lot more reactant than I do product. We would say this is product favored, this is reactant. Filling out an ice chart can be challenging if you have not used this in previous instances. The key idea is that you have an initial set of conditions where you are not at equilibrium. Changes in amounts will occur that are dictated by stoichiometry, and you will end up at an equilibrium amount of concentrations where the opposing rates become equal. So in this case, we start with six moles of SO3 sulfur trioxide in a two liter container. Now all of the values that go into here are in concentration. So six moles in two liters is a three molar concentration. It doesn't say anything about either product, so in that case we assume that we have zero to start. So initially we are not at equilibrium, we have three molar of the one gas, no molar of the other gases. Then, we're going to change where we decrease this by 2x, increase this by 2x, and increase this by x. And the coefficients there are following along our coefficients from the balanced reaction. So the stoichiometry applies here. And in other words, if you're going to have two of these molecules react, you have to form two of these and one of these. So you have to abide by the conservation of mass principle in order to get to your equilibrium amounts can't just pull an extra particle out of the surroundings. So at equilibrium, it tells us that our O2 concentration is 0.5 molar. So what that tells us is it tells us what X is. Since we started with zero oxygen and ended with 0.5 molar, X is equal to 0.5. So 2X would be equal to 1. 2X would be equal to 1. So I'd end up with the following concentrations. Now at equilibrium, I can write out my equilibrium expression using the balanced reaction. It's going to be the concentration of SO2 squared times the concentration of O2 divided by the concentration of SO3 squared. So in this case, SO2 ends up at a concentration of 1. O2 is 0.5 and the SO3 is 2. So we have 1 squared times 0.5 divided by 2 squared, which is 1 over 8, which would give us an equilibrium constant of 0 0.125.